So the testes produce a lot of sperm cells each day. We are talking millions per day, like about 300 million. Which means if you are a male that has two functioning testes, just since this video started, you've potentially produced anywhere from 50 to 70,000 sperm cells. So where do they all go? How do you keep up with such efficient production? Is there a problem if sperm cells aren't released? And of course, one of the more interesting questions, are there any potential health benefits like reduction in cancer risk from more frequent release of sperm or other reproductive substances? These are obviously very important questions that nearly every human male has likely wondered. So of course, we are going to answer these questions in the name of science. So let's do this. So just in case you've missed some of our previous male reproduction videos, or just need a quick review, sperm cells are produced in tiny tubes in each testis called seminiferous tubules. Here's a right testis or a testicle, and if you open it up, you can see these string-like seminiferous tubules. And again, if you average out 300 million per day, that is nearly 3,500 sperm cells being produced per second. But can we also mention another really cool random fact about the testes? Have you ever heard of the blood-brain barrier? This is a barrier that only allows certain substances to pass from the blood and into the brain, essentially creating this protective filter for the delicate nervous tissue. So what does this have to do with the testes? Well, there's also a blood testis barrier. Now this isn't actually a barrier of blood for the whole testis, but just a barrier between the blood and the developing sperm cells. The main reason for this is to isolate the sperm cells from the immune system because the sperm cells are actually recognized as foreign to our immune cells. So we want to prevent these developing sperm cells from being gobbled up. Now, once the sperm are produced by these seminiferous tubules, they are eventually moved into this structure on the backside of each testis called the epididymis. And there's a coiled tube inside the epididymis called the ductus epididymis. And if this were straightened out, it would be up to six meters or about 20 feet long. And this is where sperm are stored and mature prior to being released from the body. And this answers the question, where do they all go? Because you can store a lot of microscopic sperm cells in a 20 foot long tube. However, there are still potential limitations to a 20 foot long tube. And in theory, you could eventually fill this completely up with sperm cells if ejaculation were to never take place or if there was not some other way to deal with sperm that was not released. Now, I would love to tell you some epic story that when there are too many sperm cells, they go to war with one another. And it's the X sperm cells versus the Y sperm cells strangling each other with their tails and eventually cutting the epididymal sperm population in half. But it's a lot more simple than that. As sperm stay longer and longer in the epididymis, they start to break down or degenerate and get reabsorbed by other cells lining the epididymis. So as new sperm cells are being produced each day, older sperm cells are also being reabsorbed. Now this also explains what happens after the male birth control procedure called the vasectomy. A tube that is located after the epididymis, known as the vas deferens, is cut so that sperm cells cannot exit. But during male climax, secretions from the prostate, seminal glands, and bubble urethral glands are still released and to the naked eye would pretty much look identical. But under the microscope, you would see that it contains no sperm cells. So again, because sperm cells can be broken down and reabsorbed in the epididymis, if they are not released, it shouldn't be much of a problem. But could there be other potential benefits to consistent or frequent ejaculation, like a potential reduction in prostate cancer risk? Now, I can just see all the males out there getting ready to approach their significant other and say as romantically as possible, hey, it's cancer risk reduction time. So is there any reason to have more frequent ejaculations? Specifically, could there be a potential reduction in the risk of prostate cancer, which affects about one in eight men during their lifetime? And if there is a risk reduction, what is this potential correlation between prostate cancer risk and the frequency of ejaculation? Well, earlier I mentioned that the prostate produces secretions that make up part of the ejaculate, and these prostatic secretions help to protect and nourish the sperm cells. But there is a hypothesis that if there's an accumulation or a buildup of prostatic secretions, maybe some of this excess could potentially become carcinogenic, thereby creating more opportunity for the development of prostate cancer. And this is sometimes referred to as the prostate stagnation hypothesis. 
Now, to be clear, there are multiple factors that contribute to the development of prostate cancer, other than just the frequency of ejaculation and a possible prostate stagnation hypothesis. But there are two very interesting studies that I think most males will think to be quite positive. The first and one of the most prominent studies in this area followed about 30,000 men between the ages of 46 and 81, and they looked at their average number of ejaculations per month when they are in their young adulthood years, like ages 20 to 29, when they are in middle age, ages 40 to 49, and even in more their more recent years. And what they found was that a high frequency of ejaculation correlated with about a 20% risk reduction in prostate cancer when compared to the lower frequency of ejaculation. Now, of course, everyone is probably wondering what's considered high frequency versus low frequency. What does this mean? Well, high frequency was 21 or more times per month. That's quite the active bunch of individuals, whereas low frequency was about four to seven times per month. Another study in Australia found similar results. Although this was a much smaller group of just over 2,300 men, but it found that men who averaged 4.6 to seven times per week were also less likely to be diagnosed with prostate cancer before the age of 70 than those that only averaged about 2.3 times per week. And this effect appeared to be the strongest if the high frequency occurred more in young adulthood. Now, one last thing I do want to clarify is that these studies counted the total number of ejaculations, whether it was intercourse, self, or nocturnal emissions. And let's be honest, no one is really getting 21 nocturnal emissions or what we called freebies in my teenage years. They're just not getting 21 of these per month. But nonetheless, they included any freebie or nocturnal emission in the totals. So what should we do with all of the information we've discussed in this video so far? Well, first we know we don't have to worry about a buildup of sperm cells because the body will just reabsorb those on its own. But more importantly, what should we do with this information about prostate cancer risk. Does this mean that everyone should just strive for 21 times a month or five times per week? Well, there are a couple of things to consider. One, this was a risk reduction for low risk prostate cancer. This didn't include higher risk or more aggressive metastasizing prostate cancers. And although the studies, especially the first study, were well done and tried to account for multiple variables, you have to consider potential errors in self-reporting from the men recounting their ejaculation frequency, and even there still just aren't a lot of research studies in this area. So I do think it is hard to say that just everyone absolutely needs to strive for this magic number of 21. I think we still need more studies and data repeating these results before we can give a definitive answer like that. But it definitely doesn't seem like it can hurt, so if you are already at 21 or more, Good for you. If you want to strive for more to get closer to that 21, good luck in your journey. And let's be honest, there can be many other benefits if some of those 21 come with the help of that special someone that you just love and adore with all of your anatomy. So hopefully you got some fun information and useful information from today's video. Thank you for supporting our channel. If you want to continue to support the channel, like and subscribe if you already haven't. And I'm a little nervous to see what people have to say in the comment section, but go ahead and let us know what you think about the numbers we've discussed today. And of course, we'll see you in the next video.